Hey everyone, it's Mr. Keys here, and as you can see, we're not live listening, but I have a video for you guys instead. I did a lot of these last year, um, where I was making uh, individual videos for students to watch. They seemed to really like it, so I figured I'd try to do the same thing this year, especially when it comes to things like uh, short story analysis and stuff like that. It's uh, a little bit of a different setup, but I figure having something different for you guys would be cool. So today we are going to get into The Most Dangerous Game, which is the short story that we've been reading throughout the week and hopefully we get to uh, take a look at some of the things that made the story interesting and unique, talk about some of the characters, some of the themes, and uh, stuff that's going to be important for you guys going forward, especially in the quiz that you guys have later this week. So our story starts off with our main character, Rainsford, in a boat that is heading towards Brazil. He's going on a big game hunt because he is a hunter, of course. Uh, he's speaking with Whitney is uh, one of the people that's on the ship with him. They're both hunters, and they talk about how um, whether or not animals feel things whenever they're hunting and stuff like that are being hunted. This really deep philosophical thing, and Rainsford's like, ah, no, animals don't know any different. They're just out there trying to just live on instinct, basically. And Whitney disagrees. He thinks maybe animals can feel fear or pain, things like that. As they're passing by this island, which is known as Ship Trap Island, uh, Rainsford hears what he thinks is a gunshot. And so he's kind of curious. He's not sure what's happening. He tries to get a closer listen. And as a result, he drops his pipe. And when trying to go after it, he falls in the water, which, of course, reveals that the great theme of this book is actually that smoking kills. Not really, but you get the idea. Um, he sees a great light on the island, so he swims to the island to make it and try to survive. And as he's going through, he eventually finds his way to this massive, like, palatial estate thing, right? When he gets to this estate, he meets this massive man named Ivan, who apparently is like a servant or someone of the owner of the place, which is a General Zaroff. Zaroff is like this older, very like regal, very def well-defined gentleman. He's, he's very uh, uh, proper. He's the, the definition of a gentleman. And apparently he is a Cossack who is someone who basically was an officer, like served for the Tsar of Russia. And at the time, the Tsars of Russia were being overthrown in the big Russian revolution. So he had to flee his country and it ended up on this island. And as Rainsford spends more time with him, he gets, um, they have a meal, they spend time talking to one another. And it turns out that uh, General Zaroff is also a big game hunter. In fact, he's hunted some of the rarest animals in the world. And, you know, he's finding that after doing all this hunting, it's just kind of boring for him. He's not that interested. There's not that much of a challenge anymore to whatever it is that he's hunting. And so as a result, he's trying to find what is going to be a greater challenge for him. Tigers don't do it. Elephants don't do it. Cape Buffalo don't do it. None of these things are actually a challenge for him. And he's found that to him the most dangerous game to hunt is in fact man. It's kind of where the title of the story comes from, right? The most dangerous game. Is it like a game that they're playing between one another? Or is it the idea that like a game, like something that's being hunted, that's kind of like the play on words there. Like hunting man is a dangerous game to play, but also man is the most dangerous game to hunt. It's kind of a one-two sort of thing. So there. as Rainsford's hearing all this, he's like, this guy's crazy. There's no way you would actually hunt people. That's ridiculous. Like absolutely insane no way um and Zaroff disagrees well here's the thing though Rainsford is on Zaroff's island he is here he is stuck and so Zaroff gives him a choice he says either a you can play the game and be hunted or you can just get beaten by Ivan who is like a master at beating people up so Rainsford's like you know I guess I'm just gonna have to get stuck playing the game so eventually Rainsford is sent out off his own on the island, he's given a bit of a head start, and he's got to survive for three days without getting killed by Zaroff. At first, Rainsford thinks that he can just kind of weave through the woods, like through the forested areas and stuff like that, and then climb a tree to avoid capture. Um, but the thing is, though, Zaroff actually catches him pretty quickly, but he doesn't kill him. He wants there to be a bit more challenge. He wants this to keep going. Uh, he talks about how, like, the sailors are too easy to kill. He figures a hunter is going to be someone that gives him more of a challenge, and this is all about the challenge for him, right? So he wants even more of that challenge, so he lets him go. The thing is, though, is Rainsford's got a couple tricks up his sleeve. He builds this Malaysian man-catcher thing, which, like, is injures Zaroff at one point. Um, he builds a Burmese tiger trap, like this 
pit with spikes in it and stuff like that. So if you fall in it, you fall in the spikes and he kills one of Zeroff's uh, dogs. And then he also has this like setup thing where he has like a knife set to like spring forward whenever a trap is set and he acts to, and he actually kills Ivan with it. He eventually gets to the point though where Rainsford can't go anywhere else. He's he's running out of options. The dogs are chasing him. He eventually gets to like this cliff and just jumps off the edge of the cliff. And that's all we see of him. After that, our perspective shifts and we get to General Zaroff, who's bummed that this whole thing resulted in Rainsford just jumping off the cliff. Like, technically, he, as far as he's concerned, won, but it wasn't really the same. It wasn't an actual proper hunt. He just kind of, oh, he jumped off the cliff. I guess that's the end of it. But joke's on him. Rainsford had actually survived the fall and made his way to the estate and confronts Zaroff in his actual house. And they have this kind of standoff thing. And um, at the end of it, Ransford decides that, you know, he had never slept in a better bed. Like when they win, the winner of this gets either fed to the dog, like the winner gets the bed, loser gets fed to the dogs, essentially. So, and at the end, we don't really see what happened or who won. We just know that Ransford feels like oh, sleeping in the bed would be pretty nice. So with a story like this, with as few characters, it's actually pretty easy for us to break down some of the uh, character types that we see in this story. Rainsford is clearly our protagonist. He's the one that we're following along throughout the entire story. He's making a lot of those major decisions as far as like what kind of traps to set, how he's going to approach the game, uh, things like that. He's our obvious protagonist here, which makes General Zaroff seemingly our obvious antagonist. He's the one that's preventing Rainsford from getting off the island safely. He's preventing him from avoiding the hunt, things like that. So if uh, Rainsford's goal is to escape this island and continue living his life, General Zaroff is obviously preventing him from doing that. That leaves things, characters like Whitney, the, the Hounds even, Ivan, these are very minor characters. They're not there impacting the plot too significantly. They're not getting in the way of the protagonist, nor are they making any of these major decisions. So those guys are pretty straightforward in that. Obviously, with such a small cast, it's easy to make those distinctions, but we still got to do it. It would seem that Rainsford and Zaroff are actually foils for one another, uh, considering the things that they have in common, like they are both military men, they're both big game hunters. Um, these traits are very similar between the two, so Zaroff kind of sees like, oh, we're kind of the same people. But in fact, we learn more traits of the other two by their opposite. So whereas Zaroff is very like, sadistic and he doesn't consider like the lives of the animals um rainsford's kind of the opposite as he becomes the more of the prey in this instance um Zaroff has no problem with killing men because as he says in the war we killed many men right so hunting is not that big of a deal whereas rainsford is thinking the opposite right like it's fine to do this with animals but killing people is really different um and we actually start to see kind of a shift in rainsford's mentality as a result of that too when he starts to really think about it um especially as he's spending his time in the jungle like you know, I'm operating off of fear here, just like an animal would. Um, it really goes back to that conversation that he had with Whitney at the beginning of the story, where is there a reason there, or are they just operating on instinct? In a lot of ways, men operate on instinct too. So what separates them from animals? Really, at the end, though, we don't know how much of a person Rainsford has changed as. We can maybe guess, like, because he's gone through this experience, maybe he won't hunt animals anymore. Maybe he's not going to be a hunter anymore. Maybe he's starting to go crazy a little bit and kind of embrace things. But it's really hard to tell. All we really see with Rainsford in terms of like what's going on up here, it's mostly through his actions. Um, and his actions say survive. They don't really say anything else. Uh, we don't get much in terms of his thoughts or feelings. Not really. Uh, his actions are mostly just in the method of survival, depending on how you interpret the end of the story. Um, you don't get much in the way of dialogue, really. It's mostly internal and things like that. So it's hard to categorize Rainsford as necessarily being a dynamic character. He could be. He seems like he's made some changes, but we don't really get a whole lot. So part of me feels pretty comfortable saying that Rainsford is more of a static character without knowing anything else. Um, Zaroff is the same way. We really don't see any changes as far as his mentality is concerned. He's still the same sort of guy that has these same thought processes, regardless of the situation that's happened to him. He's very static and there's no changing as far as like the hounds or Ivan. Um, or even Whitney in that regard. So very static characterization all around. Though I can say that Rainsford does seem to be uh, a very round character um, versus like an Ivan or Whitney. And you might even consider Zaroff to be a round character in that way too. He has such contrast between like his physical appearance and the way he carries himself versus his thoughts on hunting and his own perspectives as far as that's concerned. I think that gives him very round characteristics. So I feel pretty comfortable saying that 
characters like Whitney, Ivan, and the Hound, very static, very flat, whereas Rainsford and Zaroff would be considered round, but also static. Um, but the argument could maybe be made for Rainsford being a dynamic character. It's just how you play it. So first off, when we take a look at like analyzing the story, we can take a look at things like the tone. So when we look at analyzing, one of the first things we can look at is like the tone and mood. Uh, this is a very dark tone, a uh, very gloomy sort of tone, and that mood is kind of conveyed to the reader as well, although there's points where the reader is supposed to feel very anxious and very uh, concerned for the well-being of Rainsford, our protagonist, um, especially when it comes to like some of those really quick movements and things like that are happening where he's against the clock, especially as he's trying to get out of that quicksand at one point. Um, that's very indicative of the of the genre that we have here. Um, this is kind of an adventure genre, uh, an action genre, so a lot of things happening, a lot of movement, um, a lot of different situations that our main character could get into, but it also has kind of a gothic horror sort of feel, which would be very familiar to you guys if you've read things like Edgar Allan Poe. So we've got this castle, we've got um, a lot of darkness, a lot of kind of sounds and things like that that are firing off, right? The gunshots that are startling. Um, the darkness that's almost impossible to see through. These are very gothic horror sort of vibes that um, create even more of that tension throughout the story because not only do you feel it in terms of the way that the story is presented in the plot, but also kind of how it's being done and sort of the scenery and setting and, and some of the little beats that happen throughout the story that make that, that effect happen. A couple more interesting points is if we take a look at like the island itself. Right. When you imagine this, this sort of setting, this place where there is really no escape, it's all about looking inwards and, and seeing all the, the complexities that come with the island. And that's kind of what Zaroff's thinking, right? He knows this island. He has it set up. It's a place of no escape. And so he can operate as if there's nothing mysterious for him, right? There's nothing that's going to be unique. Um, it's nothing too subtle, right? You know, here's an island. What's it represent? No escape, right? Lack of freedom, lack of hope. Which is interesting because the way that Rainsford does find his quote-unquote escape, so to speak, is by jumping off the edge. So that, in a way, is his escape. That is his release. That is the way he gets away. And it, in fact, um, messes up everything for Zaroff because he's like, no one jumps in the sea. That's, that's no way to actually escape. And sure enough, it actually works out for him. Another fun bit of analysis is taking a look at the difference between dark and light. Uh, traditionally, we think of darkness as being like representative of evil, and we think of light as being representative of good or something that is a savior, right? Going towards that beacon of light. Um, even Whitney had talked about it, like he feels like evil is something tangible, like wavelengths. Um, so we think of that darkness as being that evil, but the thing is, we get that messed with a little bit in this story because when Rainsford falls off the boat, what does he go toward? Go towards? He goes towards the light, right? He wants to get to salvation. He wants to get to savior. And going towards that light actually leads him into this bad situation. Now, he could have drowned, sure. But he follows the light thinking that that's going to be his safety. That's going to be what gets him out of this trouble. And it turns out to get him into uh, much worse trouble than we actually expect. So we get a bit of a deviation, a bit of a change from what we think of as being traditional dark and light sort of things. This leads to one of the biggest points of analysis in the story, which is the ending. Uh, at the end, Zaroff kind of closes himself off and, you know, decides, oh man, I can't believe that Rainsford will commit suicide. And when he goes to his room, he actually finds that Rainsford is there. Um, they have an exchange where Zaroff says, you've won, basically. Um, you know, you've won the game that we were playing, right? To him, this was a game to, su to survive and, and to get through it. And as far as Rainsford's concerned, the, he didn't win the game yet. The game is still going. Um, to Zaroff, it's, you know, survival or not survival, so he survived, so he won. Um, but Rainsford's saying, no, this hunt is still going, technically, and he calls himself a beast at bay. And that sort of leads to a lot of different thoughts on this ending. Um, some people interpret this as Rainsford kind of giving in to his beastly, animalistic sort of things. Um, some people read it as he's just saying, no, this, this hunt is still going. You've called me a beast. You've hunted me like that, so, you know, you see me that way, so... That's how I am to you. That's how I'm going to refer to myself in this instance. Um, a lot of people also see that final ending line where Rainsford says, I've never slept in a better bed, and read that as Rainsford having won the game in terms of killing Zaroff, right? That that's actually what's going to happen there. Um, but it really doesn't show who won and who lost in that way, right? We, we do kind of interpret this as there being a sort of battle, a sort of conflict between the two. Um, but just because Rainsford said that he decided that he'd never slept in a better bed doesn't mean that he actually does. So it's kind of left ambiguous. We don't know which way it actually goes. Kind of depends on how you analyze it. Did 
Reigns forgive into his animalistic instincts and kill Zaroff? Did he, um, you know, did, did he leave, right? Did he just leave the, the house? Well, seems kind of strange if he says he'd rather sleep in Zaroff's bed. So they certainly have some kind of fight, or at least it's implied that that's going to happen based on how Reigns treats it. But we don't know for sure that he actually, quote unquote, won in that regard. Um, another way people think of it is he never actually won the game because he gave in to, again, that sort of survival instinct thing. So if he's actually this, you know, beast at bay, if he's looking at himself that way, did he actually win the thing by giving up his humanity to do so? It depends on whether or not you think that Rainsford actually did that. So you can kind of go in a couple different angles there. Since the publication, it's actually gone through numerous adaptations. In fact, they made a film of it one time where they introduced a female character for some reason to give uh, Rainsford some kind of romantic interest. Um, but it's been adapted numerous times. It's been referenced dozens of times. Um, it won awards upon its initial publication. It's actually been called um, the most popular short story written in the English language. Um, so its legacy is, is quite everlasting. and it's, it's been around and it's been one that uh, uh, we'll continue to see as things go along. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the short story. It's certainly something a little bit different, um, but it's really exciting to get into and it's exciting to read. Um, it's going to be a nice introduction for us when we get into something like more Edgar Allan Poe. Um, it's also going to be really interesting when you get into more sort of adventure sort of pulpy kind of stories uh, when we read more things like by Bray Bradbury and stuff like that. So... So before the end of the video, I have two discussion questions for you guys that you guys will do in the forums assignment that I have posted to your teams. If you look at those forum assignments, you're going to see that they don't actually have any questions in them because you have to actually watch the video in order to get those. So your first question is going to be when Rainsford says that he's a beast at bay, what's your interpretation of that? Now I want you to include some quotes from the story too to justify it and make sure that they're cited properly. You don't have to include... Um, uh, you'll, you will have to include a page number, so keep that in mind. But um, what do you think he means when he says he's a beast at bay? What's your interpretation of that? And be able to support that with some of the, some of the evidence there. The other question I have is, how does the setting of the story, the way that it's laid out, the environment, the descriptions, things like that, how does the setting of the story impact how the story is read? Um, what kind of uh, impact does it have in terms of the analysis? How does it change... Um, the drama of the story, you know, the island, the setting, things like that. How do you feel that that impacts how the story is told? Ramona, do you have anything you want to tell the audience? Here, you got to speak into the mic if you want to say something. No, nothing? Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Ramona, I think this is the first time you've made an appearance in a video before. I don't think kids have ever seen you before. She doesn't like me. Anyways, guys, that's all I have for uh, for you this time around. Hopefully, you guys appreciate some of the different sort of presentation and having um, a video or something like that instead of doing the live lesson where I can kind of throw some little edits and different changes and things like that in there um, and give you kind of a different presentation. So hopefully you guys appreciated that. I'll try to continue doing that as the year goes along. Even when we go to in-person, I'd love to still keep making videos and just kind of keep editing and things like that. So um, until next time. I will see you guys later and uh, have a great one. Bye.